that is so true, isn't it? That's really what, we, what I've been trying to say today in, in many different ways is that we do have a good, good father. And our father loves us and our father believes in us and our father wants us to be blessed in life and not cursed in life and that he does have a plan and a purpose and a provision for us to be blessed in life if we will obey him and seek him and uh, listen to him that he has a way for our lives to be blessed and for his purpose to move forward in our life. And that's what he wants because he loves us. That God is not trying to find a way to hurt us and that he's not out to get us. How many of you understand that if God wanted you, uh, you're not that hard to find? Right, right? absolutely, right? If he wanted, if he was out to get you, where could you run where God couldn't find you? There's nothing... There's no place to go where God couldn't find you. So the fact that you're still alive means God's not out to get you, that he really does want your life to move forward in life because he's a good, good father. That's who he is. And I'm loved by him and I'm blessed by him because that's who I am. And if you believe that, then God says, all right, let me share with you some laws on how to be blessed in life. Now, you remember that a law is is absolute truth, and no matter where you practice it, it is true everywhere, and it can be, it's true in America, it's true in Africa, it's true in Europe, it's true in Asia. Uh, if, if it's a law, then it's going to be true wherever, like the natural laws, like the law of gravity, gravity's gravity, wherever you are. Uh, no matter what part of the globe you're in, if you're 50 pounds or 500 pounds, uh, black, white, yellow, or anywhere in between, I mean, it always works the same. You, if you're heavier than air, pff, you jump off of something, so you're going to splat you know, below, right? All right, so that's a law, and it's going to work everywhere. Well, there are spiritual laws like that, and Jesus wants us to understand that if we work and operate with these laws, and there are five of them that I'm sharing with you today, they're out of Matthew chapter 25. We started looking at them last week, and they're all five in Matthew 25. This is Jesus talking about them in Matthew 25. And he, and he starts, and let me just put the ones up on the screen that you can see. Here they are, the five from last, the four from last week, the law of ownership, the law of ownership just says God owns everything. I don't own anything that I have to get in my mind that if God owns it, it belongs to him and it doesn't belong to me. We can prove that because how much are you taking with you? That that you take with you belongs to you. No, no. What you're taking with you is nothing, right? When there are no hearses with you hauls behind them. You're not going to be buried with something in your pocket that if somebody didn't, you know, dig you up in a hundred years, it, w- it would still be there, right? You're not, you're not taking it. It's not going anywhere with you. And so God owns everything, our spirit, our soul, our body, everything. We don't own anything. So it's up to us to get, to let the owner make decisions about his property, right? We're just given charge of it, temporary charge of it while we're here on earth. The second is the law of dominion. The law of dominion just has to do with being a good steward over what he has given you, to rule over what he has given you. God's not going to give you more than you have the ability to rule over. He's given you authority over the things on this earth. And he says, here's what, here's what you've, you've proven to have the capacity to, to handle. And so I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you what you can handle. And all I'm asking is that you rule over that. You be a good steward over that, that I've given you. And I'll give you more. I'll increase your ability. That's the law of dominion. The law of use just means God does not give us anything in order for us to bury it that God expects us to put into use everything that he gives us, our abilities, our resources, everything that we have that comes from God, which is everything that we have in life. He expects us to use what he's given us, and if we do, he will give us more in order to use. God does not give us things in our life in order to bury those things. And then the law of faith says, Everything God does, he does by faith. God does not work in our lives through fear and mistrust. God does not want us to be afraid of him. He doesn't respond to us through fear. He responds to us through faith, which just means that 
when God works in our lives that we have to believe that he is, that's what the passage says, for anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He, they that come to God must believe that he is, is what? Is here, is, is present, is with me, is, is a good God, is a merciful God, a glorious God, and that he will do great things in my life. That's faith. And so when I believe that, then I go, I live like that. And I live saying God's with me and God's not against me and God's for me. And he's a good, good father. And I can trust him and I can believe him. That's faith. When I, when I respond through fear, God is never speaking to us through fear. God is never trying to make us afraid. Anytime you're afraid, that didn't come from God. That came from the devil. And the devil will always seek to make you fearful in life and keep you in the darkness because God does not operate in darkness. God operates in the light. And anytime you're operating in darkness, fear and shame and so forth, it makes you run to the darkness so you can hide. That's the devil. That's not God. So the first four laws God has given us, he said, now, this is how the spirit life functions. And so you, you, got to, you must recognize this and you must operate in, in, in these functions. Here's the fifth law. The fifth law is the law of sowing and reaping. It's a dynamic law. It's a great law. It's probably the most dynamic of all of these laws. And all five of these laws are seen in Matthew 25 as Jesus tells us how the kingdom of heaven operates. Now we're gonna read the passage in just a moment that we read last week, Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. Tal a talent is, a, is, is an, a, a, a measurement of money. And Jesus is talking about a man who has given servants a measurement of money. Although the measurement is money, the parable is not about money. The parable is about anything that you sow in life. Some parables that Jesus tells, by the way, Jesus talked more in the Gospels about money and resources and possessions than he did about heaven or hell. But I will tell you how important Jesus said understanding these principles about resources and possessions in life, how important it is for us to understand this. Over half of the parables that Jesus told in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about possessions or money or resources. Some parables are not about resources per se. They're about anything that we sow in life. And then some have the context of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about your money and about your resources, and we're gonna look at passages from both areas today so you can see the law of sowing and reaping and see how dynamic and what God says to do in life. So uh, here's a parable in Matthew 25 about talents, but it's really the context of anything you sow in life, this is how it works. For the kingdom of heaven is like, in other words, Jesus starts off saying, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the spirit world, and you need to know that everything happens in the spirit world. You think that the, the, the physical world controls the spiritual world? I'm going to show you from the spiritual world, which controls everything that happens. Everything happens in the spiritual world, and, it, and, and then it happens in the physical world, that that's how things work in life. If we could all see into the spirit world around us right now, we would see a battle going on. We would see spirits of darkness and the angels of light. We would see, we would see battles going on around all of our life. The spirit world is dynamically active around us. And Jesus said, let me tell you how the, how the spiritual world operates around you. Here's what he says. Uh, it's the, the spiritual world is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. All right, that is the law of ownership. Who owns the good? The master owns the good. How do the servants get the goods? The master gives the servants the goods. Who owns the goods? The master owns the good. He just gives them as resources for them to use. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. There's the law of dominion, which says that I'm going to give you as much as you can handle. Most people look at this passage and they say, you know, this, this, God, is, God shows favoritism. 
God gave five to one, four to another, and one, I mean, two to one, and one uh, to another. So God obviously likes this person who has five, and he hates this person who has one, but that's not what it is at all. This verse tells us, you know what God did? God studies our life. God looks at us. We have a demonstrate, the word according to his own ability, the word ability means demonstrated capacity. In other words, God looks at you, God studies you, and what, dem- what, what you demonstrate in your life to be able to handle, God says, I'm going to give you according to what your demonstrated capacity is in life. So God doesn't play favors. God says, I'm going to just give you what you can handle in life. And so this one could handle five, one could handle two, and one, uh, you know, sadly could only handle one in life. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents, which is the law of use and the law of faith. He has to believe that he has a good master, that a good master gave him a good gift, and that if he he spreads this good gift, it's going to be good things are going to happen, and this master is going to give him a reward. That's what you have to believe. That's faith. And then put it in practice is the law of use. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. There it is, the same law. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid the Lord's money. Now there's the lack of faith. There's a person who said, obviously believes this master is not fair. This pastor, uh, master is not good. And I need to be afraid of this master. So I'm going to hide what he gave me so he won't be so disappointed and lose what he gave me and you know, put me to death or in prison or whatever. So, so this is the law of faith from the negative side. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents beside them, which is just the law of use. I put into practice what you gave me. You're not going to give me more unless I use what I have, right? (laughs) Yeah, are you using what you have? Well, you say, I need more. Well, God says, you use what you have, which is the law of use, and I'll give you more. And this guy said, all right, I did it. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So there's the law of sowing and reaping. The law of sowing and reaping basically says, I'm going to give you a few things. And if you will use these few things, you can produce many things. And so because you did it, you started with a few little things. I'm going to give you a bunch of things because of what happened through the few things. So that's the law of sowing and reaping, enter into the joy of your Lord. I mean, God's happy, so you're going to get blessed out of this because he's happy. He also had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. There it is again, the law of sowing and reaping. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. See, now he's expressing why he went to hide his talent. He's saying, Lord, here's why I hid my talent. I was afraid of you. Because in my mind, you were were a hard man. In my mind, you weren't a good man. You were a hard man that expected things that you ought ought not expect. Uh, You reap where you have not sown, and you gathered where you have not scattered seed. In other words, I'm convinced that uh, I need to be afraid of you, that you're not a a person that's reasonable in life, and you're going to expect things that you shouldn't expect from me. And so, verse 25, and I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look. There, you have what is yours. And he gave him back the one little talent. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gathered where I've not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Uh, Then God, God blessed them. Oh, wait a minute, I skipped over one. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. That's the anti-Robin Hood, right? Robin Hood stole from the rich and gave to the poor, right? God says here, I'm going to take from the poor and give to the rich, which makes us go, what is God doing here? 
What is he saying? He, he's going to take away something from the poor little guy that didn't have much and you know, he didn't increase anything. In other words, God's going to give those that have a lot even more and those that don't have. Yeah, that's exactly what that means. But here's the reason why in verse uh, 29, for to everyone who has, more will be given and they will have an abundance. Well, the question then is, what, what do they have? To everyone that has, what, it, what, what is has? What, what is it that makes them get more in abundance? Well, if you read it with what it is, everyone who has the, everyone who has the ability to steward what God has given him and to take dominion over what God has given him, he, God is going to give him more and he's going to have an abundance. And the one who does not have the ability to steward what God has given him and does not have the ability to take dominion over what God has given him, God's going to take even what he has away from him and give it to the one that has the most ability in life. This is a dynamic principle of life. This is, this, is a, this is one of those unique things that God tells us about that, that control our life. Remember, this is a law from God. And so God says, all right, I'm going to be completely honest and fair about this. And if you will, do, if you will obey these laws, I'm going to bless your life. And if you don't obey these laws, then your, laws, then your lives are not going to be blessed by this. Well, where did all this start? Well, the law of sowing and reaping started in the Garden of Eden. Here in Genesis chapter 1, right after man was created, verse 28 and 29 tells us what God told Adam and Eve in the garden. In Genesis chapter 1, everybody say, that's the beginning. Okay, that's the beginning, right? I mean, you can't really go back further or a lot further than Genesis 1. So God creates man. In his own image, he breathes in them to them the breath of life. He tells them, okay, don't eat of any, you can eat of any tree in the garden, but don't touch that one that's in the center of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because if you touch that one, not touch it, if you eat of it, um, you're going to begin to die immediately. You should surely die. And, and, and then he went on to say this to them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, here's what God said uh, human beings are to be about. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Everybody say, with people. Mm. I mean, there are only two, right? So there were only two people on the earth, and so that means that everybody on this earth, uh, pat yourself and say, that's me. Uh, and look at your neighbor and say, that's you. All right, so from two people came everybody that has ever lived on the face of this earth. So the commandment of God to Adam and Eve was, number one, you are to be fruitful and multiply, and you are to fill the earth, and you are to have dominion over the earth, and, you, and, and over the sea, fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on, on the earth. And so God says, all right, I have two commandments for you, and by the way, these two commandments have never been rescinded. And here are the two commandments that God gives to humanity on this earth. Number one, that we would be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, which that just means that we're to keep the earth replenished and repopulated. That's one of our jobs, and that's never ceased. And in the Old Testament, the command was really, you know, you've got a big job ahead of you because there's nobody on earth but you two guys. And so everybody that, that, that is alive on the earth is going to come from you, so you better get busy because you got a lot. You, you, you're going to fill the earth with, with humanity. And the second commandment that he's given is take dominion over the earth, which means be a good steward. That means, that means it's your responsibility to use what I've given you well, what he's talking about, what is he talking about? Use what? I mean, it's like, okay, I've given you a command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, but how are you going to accomplish that command? Because remember, they're sitting in a little tiny garden, a little tiny spot in the middle of the Middle East 
that is a, a Garden of Eden, and, it, and it's just a little tiny spot, and, and, and man are there, and everything of God is there, but it's got to scatter out, and it's got to fill the whole earth. I mean, how, God, that's a great commandment about us filling the earth, but how are we going to do that? God said, I'm going to give you a tool, and here's the tool I'm going to give you. Look in verse 29, and God said, look, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. And so God says, all right, here are the two commandments I've given you. You take authority, you, you, you fill the earth, and then you take authority, you multiply over the earth, and then he tells them how they're going to do it, and how they're going to do it is, I have given you dominion, but you're going to have to use your seed in order to take dominion. In other words, everything that you need is in the seed that I have provided you here in, on earth. And everything that is on earth is going to come from these seeds that I have given you. If you invest the seeds, if you use the seeds, you're going to be blessed. This earth is going to be blessed. But if not, it's going to be a failure. And I'm just saying to you that if you look at everything in this sanctuary right now, you look at this pulpit, you look at those chairs, you look at the person that's sitting beside you, everything that is alive today came from a little garden in the middle of the Middle East that started with two people and a bunch of seeds where God said, take these seeds and these seeds are going to supply everything in the world that you see. Look, you are alive right now. You know why you're alive right now? Because your mom and dad planted a seed. I mean, I don't want to get too graphic and too technical about that, but the fact that they used their seed, it produced you, and that's why you are here today. Now, when I leave here, when I leave here today, and maybe when you leave here today, you're going to go home and you're going to eat part of a cow, right? Or, or, or part of a pig, or part of... Uh, that cow is there because of a seed, right? Some of you are vegetarians and you say, well, I don't eat meat, but I eat vegetable. Well, every, every vegetable that you have, where did it come from? It came from seeds that were originally in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve sowed and all the vegetables that we eat, all the fruit that we eat, and everything that is on this earth came from the seed that God gave them. So God said to Adam and Eve, if you, if you sow and reap, you can do everything that I've called you to do. It's all in the seed. Everything that I told you to do is in the seed. So the book of Genesis gives us the preface of what our seed is and how to use and what are the commandments God says. Now, the apostle Paul obviously understood. That's just, this is Matthew 28. It's, it's just the, in, in the New Testament, Jesus adds to the seed of, uh, of supplying everything. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do everything I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always. That's just Jesus' way of saying, you know, in the Old Testament, the command to be fruitful and multiply really had to do more with filling the earth with people because there weren't people. But now in the New Testament, Jesus just kind of, kind of adds a spiritual concept to this and says, oh, also, uh, you need to multiply spiritually. You need to, you need to uh, go out and you need to, to reach other people. You need to spiritually spread the seed of the kingdom of God so that you don't go to heaven by yourself, right? We, we shouldn't want to go to heaven by ourselves. We, we would want to take someone with us. And so Jesus said, all right, uh, being fruitful and multiplying not only has to do with this physicality of life, but it has to do with spiritually multiplying the kingdom of God. Now, the apostle Paul understood evidently the law of sowing and reaping because he has many passages about this. We're going to look at two of them really quickly today, all right? First is Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, this is what the Apostle Paul says. Now, let me give you this little understanding. The Apostle Paul, like Jesus, told, uh, gave principles and laws in, in a context. Every passage of Scripture in the Bible has a context. What am I saying? I'm saying that there's a reason. There's a, there's a, some, when he speaks these words, it's, in, it's, it's within an understanding of what is around this and, whether, and what he's talking about. 
Well, there are two types of context that Paul speaks in. One is in the context of, of universal application, and that just means when he tells this, it's about anything that you apply it to, about any area of life that you want to put it in. It is universal application. And then there are some where he's talking about money, and it's obviously about money, and, and it doesn't have to do with other things. It just has to do with money and finances and possession. This particular one is about anything. Any, anything in life that you sow, this, this is going to fit you. All right, here it is in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if you, if you don't lose heart. So the Apostle Paul starts off by saying, do not be deceived. That just simply means is, uh, in this, if you don't believe in the law of sowing and reaping, you are deceived. If you don't believe that this is the way that God operates, you got, your, your, your mind is messed up and you're, uh, you're not seeing life the way you're supposed to be. You are deceived in life. So in other words, he's saying, look, you don't, you don't need to live deceived, so pay attention to what I'm saying. Don't be deceived. This is for real, he's saying. And God will not be mocked. Which this is a little interest, really a little interesting word, mocked. The word mocked is from the Greek word mukterizo. Your mu in, in Greek, your mukter is your nose. Mukterizo is to uh, lift up your nose. So what is the Apostle Paul saying here? He's saying, don't be deceived. Don't believe a lie and be so smart that you, give, you, you lift your nose to God. Because God's not going to be mocked like that. Believing that this thing doesn't work. Paul's saying, don't get these lies into your head and throw up your nose at God believing that this law doesn't work. It does work. Everything you sow in this life, you're going to reap it back 100% of the time. If you sow good seed, you'll reap right stuff. You'll reap good stuff. If you sow bad seeds, and we all at times sow bad seeds, right? Sometimes we sow seeds of sin, we sow seeds of hate, we sow seeds of greed. I mean, sometimes we sow bad seed, and that's fine if you want to sow bad seed, but you need to understand that those bad seed are going to come back to you just like the good seed are going to come back to you. Don't be deceived and don't think this law doesn't work and be so arrogant that you throw up your nose at God and insult God by believing that what he says is the way it operates is not the way he operates at all. Understand, it's fine if you want to sow bad seeds, but understand, sin has a harvest. I mean, sin is fun, right? I mean, I, I mean let's just, I, I'm not trying to promote it, but I'm trying to just be honest. I mean, sin is fun, right? That's why God has to tell us, don't do it. If it wasn't fun, no, God wouldn't have to say, don't do it, because we wouldn't want to do it, because it's not fun. Sin is fun, it really is, but but the problem is the harvest that it brings, right? Sin would be fun if it didn't bring that bad harvest with it. Because when we sin, just like when we do good, there's a harvest that follows the actions that we take in life. And if it wasn't for death, <laughs> you know, then sin might be fun in life. But, but, but Paul said, look, you got to know and you got to believe that whatever you sow out there, you're going to reap back whether it's good or bad. And so, and so uh, understand this. And if you don't believe that, you are deceived in life. And then, oh, let me see one more little verse. Verse nine, it, it, this is important. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. What does that mean? He tells us don't get weary don't get tired, don't get restless in doing good stuff because every seed has a gestation period. In other words, you're going to reap what you sow and you're going to reap more than you sow and you're going to reap later than you sow. Why are you going to reap later than you sow? Because every seed you sow has a certain amount of period of time in which it's going to bring forth its fruit, right? 
If you plant, if you plant grass seed, just naturally you plant grass seed, uh, you can expect it to come up maybe in a few days. If you plant a human seed, it's going to take nine months, right? If you plant an elephant seed, uh, the most of uh, the, it has the longest gestation of all mammals, it's going to take about 18 months to bring. All seeds have different periods of gestation, but all of them bring forth fruit. So every time you sow a seed, it, it has a return on it. Sometimes it may take 20 years for it to return, or it might take 15 years for it to return, or it might take three days for it to return, or three hours or three seconds. And some seeds have an immediate return on them, right? If you don't believe what I'm saying about that, just go to your mate and say, ask, uh, are you gaining weight? Uh, I'll guarantee you that that's, that's going to have an immediate result. That's going to bring back something or but, but, but the Apostle Paul says, look, don't grow weary in well-doing. And the reason he has to say that is some people hear this sowing and reaping and they try it for about two or three days and then they quit because they don't see any results of this. God said, look, you're going to have to realize that when you sow a seed that it might not have an immediate result because all seeds have different gestation periods and you're, not, you're going to have to hang in there and don't grow weary while you're doing good because I'm telling you, what you sow, you're going to reap and it's going to come back to you. And if you don't believe that, the Apostle Paul says, you need to get your head right. Don't be deceived and, and not believe that this is true. And so God says if you sow it, you're going to reap it, and that's just something that you have to believe in life. Some of you believe that you've gotten ripped and rooked and all of that in life, and if I had time to go into that, and I may do it at some other time, I, I would help you with that. But, but basically, God says whatever you do, just keep sowing good seed. Because if you keep sowing good seed, he says, here's the law. Those good seed are going to produce good crops, and those good crops are going to start coming back to you. And sometimes you're leaving, living in the, in the, in the, in the uh, negative uh, harvest, in the bad crops, in the rotten return of somebody in your life that has sown seed that have been bad seed, and, and, you know, and you're stuck in the harvest of some of their bad seed. Uh, but when you're stuck in the harvest of some of their bad seed, uh, that's not coming back at you because you did it. It's coming back because a generation ahead of you did it. Uh, poverty and, and um, uh, loneliness. and uh, uh, Maybe that was the harvest that's coming back from seeds that were sown in generations before you, and you're just now harvesting this. But God says, if you're in that kind of a situation, just hold your head up, keep, keep sowing good seed, and, and, sooner, and, and sooner or later, that bad harvest is going to run out. Out, and then you're going to begin to harvest great things that are coming back by the decisions that you made. But don't give up on it. Don't get weary because that's the way that God works. And so, like the book of Ecclesiastes said, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, if you will cast your bread on the water, that your bread will come back to you. So it may take 20 years for your bread to come back, or it might take two days for your bread to come back. But God says, hang in there and do what I'm telling you to do. And I promise you, you're going to get a return on what God has said in life. And so that's the context of money, of, 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 of anything. Anything that you sow, it's going to come back. Now, here is what the apostle says in context of money and resources. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The apostle Paul, right before this, is taking an offering for the church in Jerusalem, and he's telling the Corinthians, I'm taking an offering to help those people in Jerusalem in the church, and if you will extravagantly give, God is going to really bless you in life. That's what he's doing. So the apostle Paul's taking an offering, and notice what he says to them. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, in other words, God is powerful to perform, and God is powerful to perform to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So the Apostle Paul, in the context of money, is saying, when you give money, let me show you how the, how, what happens with the seed of money. And so the seed of money, the implication here is that money is not a dead seed. 
That money is not something that you put in an offering plate or an offering box and it just dies right there. Once you give it, it's just gone and it has no return on it. The Apostle Paul is saying your money is a seed. And when you sow your financial seed, your financial seed, he says, just like your word seeds and your deed seeds and your good seeds and just like them, your money is going to bring a return on it and God's going to give back a blessing. And he says, if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. And God is able, able to make all grace abound to you so that and you will have all sufficiency in all things that you will have an abundance to every good work. What does that mean? That just means that when you give money, when you give financially, that God is going to give back to you in the same way that you give it out. If you give bountifully, God gives it back bountifully. If you give sparingly, God gives it back sparingly, and it's going to come back to you. And then he says, you know, God is going to give you all grace so that in all things, God's going to give you the ability to have all sufficiency to every good work. What does that mean? It just means that some people don't need money back, right? I mean, some people, when they give an offering, they're not expecting any return financially. Many times they do get return financial. And if that's good and that happens, that's great, wonderful. But everybody doesn't need to be blessed financially. Sometimes There are lots of people that put offerings in that it doesn't hurt them a bit to put that much money in. I mean, that doesn't, they're, not, they're not sitting there all anxious because they can't pay their bills and they need a return from God. So they didn't, when they put that financial offering in, they don't need money back, but they do have some need in their life. Maybe they have a child that's lost. Maybe they have a chronic disease that the doctors say can't be healed. Maybe it's somebody in your family that needs to be saved and redeemed. You need the grace of God in some area of your life. And the Apostle Paul is saying, when you sow your seed, God makes it able so that the harvest of that seed seed can come back and bless you in other areas of life that don't have anything to do with finances in life. So the law of sowing and reaping is if you sow bountifully, if you sow sparingly, you're going to get back what you sow. Let me give you some lessons from uh, smart farmers, all right? Smart farmers, thank God we have smart farmers and they have to be smart because uh, they wrestle every day with what uh, the insurance companies call uh, the, uh, the acts of God. What are acts of God? Acts of God are those floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, droughts, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes. <laughs> every horrible thing that happens on the earth is an act of God. It's amazing how many people don't believe in God, but somehow the insurance companies believe that God has terrible acts and everything, <laughs> you know. It's funny how the acts of God are always something horrible in life. But anyway, so smart farmers have to, have to uh, uh, sow and invest in spite of the acts of God. So, so, so they, they, don't, they don't play about things. Let me just show you, uh, this is what we learn from some smart farmers in life. Number one, don't eat all your seed. Hmm? Your seed is not in your stomach, Right? I mean, your seed is not for you to put in some bank account somewhere. What your seed is, what you sow. So what smart farmers know is, look, if I don't put some seed in the ground this year, I'm not going to get a crop. And all, all, all I'm saying is what we learn from this is don't eat all your seed. Uh, 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 if you eat all your seed, you're not going to have anything to put in the ground. And if you don't put any seed in the ground, you're not going to reap any harvest, right? Right? And so your life is, is, is not going to be fulfilled. You're, you're not going to have anything to sustain your life. So don't eat all your seed. I'm amazed at how many people eat all their seed. They spend every dime they make. They, don't have, they can't invest in anything. They can't give it anything because they don't have a dime. As a matter of fact, they spend more than they, more than they take in because they have credit cards and so forth and blah, blah. But don't, don't eat all your seed. Here's the second thing you learn. Plant what you want to harvest. This is really important. I gave you, if you have the notes, I gave you a little, a little note that, that has this little story about it. Um, can you imagine a farmer standing out in his field just frustrated and angry saying, what's all this corn doing here? I've got a whole section of corn out here. It's unbelievable. His friend walks up and says, Harry, what did you plant? And Harry says, corn. But I didn't want corn, I wanted cotton. Well, what's all this corn doing here? His friend says, Harvey, I, I got a doctor I want you to see. 
Um, <laughs> if you didn't want corn, then why did you plant corn? If you didn't want hay, then why, did you, why would you plant hay? If you don't want to be talked about, then don't plant gossip, right? If you want favor in your life, then why did you reject that person? You just, why didn't you give them favor? What this rule or what this thought is that you need to plant what you want to harvest in life. Why do people plant seeds that they don't want to harvest? You know, it, the words that you speak are seeds. The actions that you do are seeds. Everything about your life is a seed that God has given you to plant. And when you talk about things, you, you need to think, okay, I'm planting a seed here that's going to bring a crop, so I need to be careful what I say about these things. You know, I, I've heard this quite a bit, you know, because I'm, I'm everywhere in, in society and church and all that kind of stuff. I've heard people use, uh, basically curse their kids. And by curse, I mean, you know, they use words about them like, like you know, Hoover down, you know. And, and you'll hear them, those blank kids. And then they're surprised when those kids act like blank kids. That blank garage door, and then they wonder why the garage door is cursed in life, you know. It quits working. And when you curse everything in your life, then you shouldn't be surprised when your whole life ends up being cursed. And a, a smart farmer understands that you want to plant the harvest that you want. Let me give you the last one. Plant based on how much you want to harvest. If you want to harvest a big, a big crop, then you got to plant a big crop because you harvest based on how much you plant. Again, the farmer in the standing in the field, he's saying, the farmer's out there saying, there's only 10 stalks of corn in my field. How can, I, how can I live on 10 stalks of corn? His friend says, well, how many seeds did you plant? He says, 10. Well, you desperately need to go see the doctor, that doctor I was talking about. But why are you surprised that you only have 10 stalks of corn when you only planted 10 seeds? According to what Jesus says, by the same measure that you measure, God's going to use it to measure back to you again. He says, God says, God says, look, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to take the same measure that you measured with, and I'm going to measure this back to you. Luke 6, 6, 38, let me just read that quickly. Give and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Will it be put in your bosom? For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus is just saying, look, be careful when you give because the measure that you use to give, I'm gonna use that same measure to measure it back to you. How does that look in heaven? Well, it would be like this. God's up in heaven and I'm praying, God, I need a blessing. I need for you to move in this situation. And that God hears my prayer and God says, oh yeah, I'm in the blessing business. You need to be blessed. You're my child. You're asking for a blessing. All right, we, I got a bunch of blessing up here. So let me just get some blessing for you, all right? And he says, angel, he said, bring me Keith's uh, measure. And the angel looks around and he finds my measure that I measured out with and it's, he brings it back over and it's a little eyedropper. God's got this gigantic big pool of blessing up there. And God says, you know, Keith, I'd love to bless you in life and I'd love to give you a big blessing in life because you need a big blessing in life. But, but, but I'm gonna only be able to use the measure that you've sent here in heaven. So God doesn't determine how much you're blessed. You determine how much you're blessed. By what kind of measure you measure it out. If you're stingy and grudging, God uses a very stingy little tiny measure to measure it back. If you're generous and good hearted and all that, you know, if you if you if you have a heart like the Grinch you stole Christmas that was three sizes too small, and you just give this grudging little thing, then God's gonna use that same measure to measure back to you. So God takes this eyedropper, he dips into this big old pool of blessing, and he comes over to me and he drops that blessing on me, and I'm down here needing a big blessing, and I, you know, something hits me. What was that, a bird? You know, you know, and, I, and that's all I received because that's all I gave. What I would like to have is when I ask God for a blessing in heaven, that God would say to the angel, bring me Keith's blessing. And the angel says, well, we're going to have to have some help over here because this is a gigantic big ladle right here. And so the angel brings it over and they dip in and it's a gigantic big ladle and God uses that big ladle to pour back in, into my life. Your blessing in life depends on how much you've sown and what kind of measurement you have used 
to measure things out to you again. God says, don't be deceived. What you sow, that's what you're going to reap 100% of the time. The good and the bad. Don't sow stuff you don't want to reap. Don't talk about people. Don't talk about things. Don't curse your family. Don't curse your life. Don't curse your business. Open up your heart. Be generous. I mean, look, what you sow is what you're going to reap. That is a law of God. And you're going to reap what you sow. If you sow corn, you're going to reap corn. If you sow hay, you're going to reap hay. If you sow seeds of discontent, people are going to be discontented and angry at you. If you sow seeds of talking about people and downgrading their character, people are going to sow back gossip about you. You're going to be the bun of all that. I mean, it's just a law of God that we reap what we sow. So don't sow seeds of things we don't want to reap. Sow seeds with a, with a measure of how you want God to measure it back to you. If you want to be stingy and hard-hearted and small and have a little tiny ladle that God uses to pour it out on you, then you can do that. But if you want the abundance of God's blessings, I want to be generous. I want to be big-hearted. I want to be compassionate about the things that God, you know, inspires me to give. And I have to be a good steward. I have to pray and ask God because this is not my stuff. This is God's stuff. Don't be foolish and think that you can just do anything you want because this stuff does not belong to you. And God expects you to be a good steward and take dominion over what he's given you dominion and rule over it well. Rule your heart, rule your mind, rule your mouth, rule your life, rule your family, you know, rule, rule over what God has given you in life. And use everything God has given you. Quit being stingy and digging and putting it in a hole because you're not going to get any more until you use what God has already given you. And believe that God loves you. He wants the best for you. He's given you good stuff. And if you will use it, he will do what he said in life. All right, bow your head with me if you would, please. All right, praise the Lord. That's a big, that's a dynamic principle of God. It's a big principle of God, but it's really very simple, isn't it? It's not, it's not hard to understand sowing and reaping, right? And I know what the tendency is. The tendency of many people in congregations when they hear about the law of sowing and reaping is they have the tendency to go, what kind of bull is that, you know? I mean, that fellow's up there, he's trying to talk me into giving some money because he wants me to give money to the church or he wants some of it himself. Or you have all kind of things the devil is saying to you right now about why you shouldn't listen to what I just said to you. But I'm telling you, this is a law of God. And you must obey the law of God and if you want God's blessing in your life. And this is a dynamic blessing of God. Look, Genesis talks about it. Jesus talks about it. The apostle Paul talked to the Galatians about it and the Corinthians about it. It is a principle of God. So don't be deceived and turn your nose up at God and say, that's a bunch of hogwash. God says, you reap what you sow. So right now...